today on Hampton Roads Business Weekly, what to expect when two companies merge, plus the business of live video and the key elements of a successful nonprofit. Get ready, Hampton Roads Business Weekly starts right now. Hello and welcome to Hampton Roads Business Weekly, a look at the businesses and entrepreneurs making a difference right here in Hampton Roads. I'm Cheryl Tan. Zach Miller will join us later on in the show. We begin today with our series on nonprofit organizations, specifically the keys to growing them successfully. We are answering the question, how do you grow a successful nonprofit organization? Talking with the leaders of Tide Swimming head coach and four-time Olympic swimming coach Jack Roach and Katie Aris Wilson, the president of the board of directors of Tide Swimming. Thanks so much for talking with us about this very important subject because you have a very systematic plan in place that allows the growth because you tap into member strengths. So I want to talk about that right now and how your board of directors is made up and what you put into that board to make it succeed. Well, thank you, Cheryl. Thank you for having us. Um, what we've done as an organization in order to support growth of um, reaching more kids and achievement of those kids is we have a pretty large board, which some people say, why do you have such a large board? And the, the reason is simply put is that there's a lot of work to get done. <laughs> and, um, and there's a lot of different types of work. And so, you know, we have people on our board that have children, most of them have children on the team. So they're a great conduit to just give us constructive feedback um, so that we're always in touch with our membership. It's super important that we really understand, are we serving our members well? Um, but there's a lot of things in terms of business, of our strategic direction. How do we get pool space? Do we have a secure uh, uh, um, runway of lane space in terms of the arrangements we have with the YMCA? Um, are we accounting? Are we fiscally sound in terms of our business processes? We have a, a part-time accountant. We have an executive director. We produce financial statements every month that we review. Um, we, uh, we submit our Form 990s. We pour over our details. We look at our budget every month and say, are we ahead or are we behind? Where do we need to manage expenses? Um, you know, we are so fortunate to have parent volunteers who have stepped in significant roles. And so I want to bring in Jack here as the person who's growing those Olympic swimmers. You're, you're helping to mold them and help them be better in the lanes. You don't have to worry about any of this stuff. Is that right? Like that's not anything that has uh, to worry, that you have to think about because you're focused on your thing. Right, that, that's really not a piece of what I do. At the same time, it has great value to what I'm doing. And yeah. I, uh, for me, the message is uh, alignment with values and principles that, that parents relate to, that businesses relate to, that schools relate to, that community relates to. And when you, can, when you can provide that, and it's a strong enough message that not only do, do the team members support it, but it starts to expand into the community based mm -hmm. on the young people you work with going out into the community and helping to share that message, then you're on to something that's much bigger than swimming itself. Oh, absolutely. So I want to delve a little bit more into the board of directors. It seems like it's very systematic. You have a CPA, you have somebody good at marketing. Like, are you, like in your parent meetings, are you looking for people? Do you target them? Like, what do you do to make sure you have a board filled with people who can help grow your organization? Um, well, there, there's a there's some of it's um, <laughs> art, some of it's science. Um, I mean, we have you know we have a by bylaws that we we go by, and we have people offer up their names to to serve on the board, and um, we don't always get as much interest as we would like because it is a hard position. We ask you to meet once a month. Um, the third Thursday of every month and come to a meeting which is usually two hours long um, but we're really outside those meetings we ask you to do work I mean we really need the help and so um, a lot of people these days are very very busy and right. it, it does create a challenge it's not that they don't want to help it's usually they don't have the time but you know we try to get to know our members we've got a very even though we're a very large team we try to keep that family feel and we talk to each other at swim meets and we volunteer together and I'm always keeping my ears open for people that have different skill set because I think generally and, and to, to speak to something Jack when you have an organization that is 
doing such a great job developing your child, um, doing it the right way, positive reinforcement, helping them take ownership, helping them really set their goals and um, take accountability for, for their actions to support those goals. I think parents and volunteers, they want to they wanna be a part of a, a program that, that does it the right way and is successful. And so I've never felt like this team has lacked volunteers. Some can do it more specifically. And we have, to be honest, sure, we've got parent volunteers that don't even serve on our board per se, but step up to incredible things that really vault our team and elevate it. I think maybe it's setting the vision and then letting your parents know or people in the community know that they are you're happy to have them help. <laughs> That's correct. It and all and comes that is together. a big part of it. It's, it's, you know, we have a vision. I think we've, we've shown what we can do. We've shown the quality of people that are leading our children, with Jack and the rest of the staff. And um, we, which I think sometimes we're a little too shy, but we're not trying to, too shy to say, you know, we could use your help. And uh, I've been always um, really impressed and humbled by just the whole community of Hampton Roads because super supportive. All right. Well, wonderful. Okay. Thank you very much. And thanks for sharing with us your story. Thank Jack you, and Katie. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Two companies merging, what to expect when that happens next on Hampton Roads Business Weekly. All right, we are here with Martin Joseph and Justin Carter of 360 IT Partners. And something crazy happened in 2015 in March. You guys merged and you guys had two separate businesses, both were doing well. And over a conversation about paintball, you guys decided to start communicating with each other. Tell me about the origins of kind of how you guys met um, and then we'll talk about kind of the next steps and how the merge actually happened. Yeah, Justin. Yeah, so I, uh, you know, wanted to get to know my competition in the area, and I reached out to Martin and challenged his team versus my team in a game of paintball. Mm. And uh, we went back and forth through email, deciding on dates. It, it never did actually happen, but I think that that's kind of what lit the spark for us to get together and maybe uh, find out if we had some synergies. Someone would probably say that talking to your competition might be a bad thing. Why were you not afraid to reach out, I guess? Well, I wanted to know what everybody else was doing. I wanted to know the personalities in the area. You know, I wanted to be a known personality among that group of people. So, yeah. And so when he emailed you, yeah. you... You know, I, I, was, I was, you know, entertained it and said, hey, you know, maybe we can get some people together. Game on. Challenge for paintball. I've never played paintball, so. <laughs> and then when I went to my team and I said, hey, you guys want to play paintball? They're like, wow, we've never played paintball. So, you know, about maybe, nine, 10 months go by and you know, I was thinking about Justin and I said, hey, just, why don't we just, let's get together for lunch, me and you. you know, we went to lunch, we had a great conversation. You know, I got, feel like I got to know him a little bit better, um, under, try to understand what his business was about. Found out that we were very well matched as far as yeah. like what kind of business we were doing, what kind of tool set we were using. Um, I knew that Justin had a, a deep bench of talent on his team, technical talent, and that was, some, that was an area that we needed some some additional resources there. Um, and I, we never mentioned anything, you know, at the table about merge or anything like that. And um, about a week went by and I called him directly and I said, hey, Justin, I said, I said, you got a minute? He said, sure. I said, well, you might want to sit down, right? And so- <laughs> Were you standing The old sit down message. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I said, you know, I know this is kind of out of the blue. I said, but what would you think about us talking about merging our companies together? And, uh, you know, he seemed and, very open to it. And, you know, at that point, I, I laid back in my chair, <laughs> and I really had a lot, to, a lot of thinking to do at that point. And, uh, you know, we, we went out and, and went out a few times, and I'd ask a, a group of people that I consider to be a mentors to me, sure. you know, about the, the opportunity. And, and they said, well, you know, you need to get to know them. So that's exactly what we did. You know, we, we went out together, we brought our families together, we did some hibachi with our families. We just really got to know one another. Mm -hmm. So. Nine months go by, you email, you guys talk every once in a while, I guess, and you figure it out. Um, then you guys get together, that goes well. You then say, hey, I, I think this actually could be a good idea. What are some of the things that you need to look about, uh, look into about kind of the marriage of a business mm -hmm. to make sure that things were gonna gel and be yeah. okay? Culture was huge, right? We knew we had to be fit culturally for one another. And, and you know, we were really excited about the, changing our culture and making it even better. You know, Justin had some really cool ideas. You know, we talked about that in detail. Um, we, we just wanted to really make sure that we were gonna meld together well as a company. And I think if you can figure out the culture piece, everything else will fall into place for sure. Yeah. Culture is a huge thing for me. And I always like to say when I first met uh, 360, when I first met Martin, it was, it was Microsoft. And you know, uh, three, uh, and TechLogic was Google, yeah. and so we had to meld that sort of two different cultures together. And I think we've done a good job yeah, of that. At this I think point. we have. So the management 
seem like, okay, we're good. We, we're, we're having a good relationship. It seems like this is something we really want to do. But on that ground level, how, how important was it to really understand that they were okay with it? Was that something that you guys looked into? Did it, did it end up not mattering? How do, how do you kind of I really don't think that? it ended up mattering. I mean, we, I think everybody was really kind of excited about it. You know, when, when they realized that, you know, there was more opportunity, we were gonna grow together as a company. Um, you know, I think my company was probably, you know, we were doing maybe, you know, three or four times the, the business volume that Justin was at the time. And, you know, we, we talked about how, you know, together we, we could really make the tides rise. Um, and we have, you know, and uh, I think we have, have built a company that is, uh, is, is really, you know, the envy in the IT industry um, as far as the processes and our practices. And so, you know, I think we're both very, very proud of that. And we continue to improve on it all the time. Very cool. We'll have part two coming up next, talking about the nuts and bolts and, and really hammering out the, the paperwork, all the hard stuff coming up next. <laughs> Thanks. Welcome back to Hampton Roads Business Weekly. We are here with Martin Joseph and Justin Carter of 360 IT Partners who recently merged. So in the first part we talked about kind of getting to know each other, but you know, those things are very important. But let's figure out valuations, is, is what I'm willing to put into the business, what it's worth, stuff like that. So how did you guys start having those conversations? What were the things that you were looking in, in evaluation? So I. Um I suggested to Justin that we get an evalu evaluation for both companies. And you know what was really great was that we, we could create a benchmark um, on the same standard. So when we met with, with the evaluator, we were very specific with him. We said, listen, we want you to benchmark both companies on, on their own merits from you know, revenue, profits, you know, look at absolutely everything side by side so, so that he can come up with a, with a real value, right? And so there was, um, you know, basically it was a true merger where there was, a, where there was equity, you yeah. know, that Justin, um, you know, became a part of. And so, um, you know, based on the figures that, that our evaluator came back with, we, we were able to kind of come together and make a deal. And we agreed ahead of time that the numbers were the numbers, you yeah. know, that the, the numbers will be what they are and that's, you know, we would do it even based on the numbers. Because valuations are something that, are very difficult to come up with, mm -hmm. even right. even when you go get a valuation mm -hmm. from someone, right? Some people will say, the value is whatever someone's willing to, to buy you at. And right. may, you know, maybe that's for the crazy unicorn companies, but um, so revenues, profits, what other things were they looking at kind of in the valuation of that? Right. Did you guys disagree on anything? Was there any pushbacks, stuff like that? Sales history, you know, I think that's another big mm -hmm. strong How deep? thing. You know? right. Five yeah, years, yeah, three yeah. years. It, it, yeah. Three years, I think, is what he right. looked at, but. And um, you know, com customer retention was, was really big too, yeah. you know? Sure. Um, you know, there was some. There was definitely some concerns there. Justin had a, a, a pretty significant account that that accounted for a good portion of his revenue, and you know that was a concern. But you know, I looked beyond that, and I and I saw the value of, of the talent that ja that Justin's bringing to the table as our CTO. This is an incredibly talented talented guy. Technically, he's he's incredibly talented. That's what I love to do. Yeah. So you know, I knew I knew that I was gaining a solid member on my sure. team. They had a partner. You know. Absolutely. So that bit, how did you, when you started um, putting companies that used to work with Techlogic now with 360, how was those conversations like, hey, we're merging, yeah. you know, what was that whole process like? Well, we talked about the economies of scale and talked about, you know, leveraging tool sets and leveraging skill sets and having a, a larger team, uh, a larger talent pool to pull from. Um, all of our, our clients are really open to it. We had a 100% conversion rate. Oh. Um, you know, so it, it was really a non-issue. But yes, it was a concern that I had, obviously, because every client, you know, I had a personal relationship with every client that I've done business with. Sure. So. What were some of the headaches in the process that kept you guys up at night? What was my team going to think? You know, what, you know, the, the, was my team going to be happy with the move? You know, that's, that's really important to me, you know, the people and, and their perception of, of the environment. And so, you know, I spent a lot of time up front talking to my people about the whole thing and just making sure everybody was comfortable with it and, um, you know, that I had buy-in from my team because that, that was really important to me. Perception's huge, right? Whenever mm -hmm. anything happens one way or another, the way that your team thinks it is, and if you tell a bad story along with it, it, it can really ruin that whole piece. Was there anything that kept you up 
night? You know, I think, I think that uh, I'm going to be just really candid about this. You know, Justin used to own his own company, right? Yeah. And he was calling all the shots and making all the decisions. And he became a part of a, of a company that had a, a very tight-knit partner group. And we have systems and processes in place that, that really work well for the business. And, and I think, you know, for the first probably eight, eight to ten months, it was a bit of a struggle for Justin. And, and I think, you know, it was really awesome. For the first time, I think we were, we were at, a, uh, at, a, at a, a fundraiser event, and Justin approached me and took me aside. And he said, hey, you know what, I just want to say thank you. Because I promised him that I'd make his life better, and like, we'd give him his life back, and that you know we we could help him do what he loves to do. And then it took a long time for him to adjust. And when he said thank you, man, I mean that just made my it, it was the best experience ever. Because you weren't the man anymore, basically, right? You you weren't calling. Well, I like to still think that I'm the man, of course, right. but yes, I wasn't 100% owner anymore, and that's uh, you know that, that that was definitely a big change. Yeah, but we make we make decisions together. You know, I mean I'm. I get my advice. I get advice from my partners all the time. You know, we we collectively make decisions. Yeah. We do shareholder meetings once a month. It's very you know unilateral. Looking back, it's bilateral. been a, f a few years now. It seems like you guys are still very happy with the decision. If if someone was talking about a merger, what, were, what would some of the advice be uh, that you guys would give them from both of your positions? I mean, get to know the other person. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. I think that that's really important because you got to connect. You know, people do business with people. And uh, you know, I think it's really important to have that relationship to connect and understand each other on a personal level. Awesome, Justin Martin. Appreciate your time. Thank you, Zach. Thank you. How do you keep up with changing technology when video is your business? We're going to talk all about that with Vanessa and Mark Lane of View It Do It coming up next on HR Business Week. We're talking about video marketing today, especially live streaming, and how hot it is. According to HubSpot. 55% of people watch videos every single day. We're here today with Vanessa and Mark Lane, the owners of View It, Do It, based in Norfolk, and your business has exploded over the last couple of years. Now, while your business is just a couple of years old, you've been live streaming for quite a long time. We started a long, long time ago doing destination marketing. We have live cameras that were in Hawaii, in Key West, Florida, and Miami, and other countries and we were using them to help hotels market their properties and attract tourists and attract guests. And the unique thing was at the time, we let people remotely control the camera so they could actually go in and move the camera around and watch the people in that area, in that destination. So then a couple of years ago, Facebook Live happens, Snapchat Live, Instagram Live, and where are you in your business? We took what we were doing in destination marketing and we basically created something that was mobile. It had its own power, it had its own internet. I could literally take it to a beach and stream a wedding. I could do sports events on the fly. I could do, you know, fun runs, 5K runs from the middle of the street and still do everything we were doing attached to a, a building completely on the fly, completely mobile. So talk about the growth over the last couple of years. Have you been surprised by how many people want to see this real-time action happening in an event they're not, maybe not involved in? We've right actually been surprised by a number of different things, for better or for worse. <laughs> we started out very, very small and had a grand idea that this would work, it would be fantastic. And we started out originally thinking that it would be the wedding space that would be the most yeah. active, the most attractive, because grandma can't make it. Of course, they're going to want to have us there to live broadcast that special day to the world. And it turns out that either through our inability to appropriately market it or something, that that was not our huge growth potential. The huge growth potential was on the events for charities and runs and, and bands and concerts and all of those other things. All of those people were dying to get the word out about their event and not so much on the wedding side, much to my chagrin and my surprise. Yeah, so you pivoted. We did pivot. You know, with technology, you have to change. You have to innovate. You have to, you know, decide what people want. And what people want is, it's great to be able to see a 12-hour festival, but people want short content in real time, and they want to feel like they're there. And so what better way than to give them short bursts now and then and basically, you know, let them experience it from their comfort of their phone. So you will live stream the whole event, but then give them the short bursts that they want. Exactly. Kind of give them you know, both of, best of both worlds. Exactly, exactly. So say we're at a concert. We have, we'll drop down a crowd cam and let people control the camera from their phone. And they can play with it all night. They can see what's going on from the crowd's perspective. But I want to give them short bursts. I want to highlight five minutes, less than five minutes, minute at a time, and get them really engaged. 
It's hard and humbling, you know, when you are so knee deep in your expertise to have to like sit back and, and sort of examine the landscape and say, okay, this is not working. I need to do something else. How hard was that? <laughs> well, it would have been easier, but I don't like to be wrong. So <laughs> being wrong is a little bit of a problem for me and right. having to go, darn it, this is just not working. What can we do? So we brainstorm. We talk about it all the time. What's next? Where should we go? And we're totally open to trying it. We've done some very, very bizarre things and some of them work and some of them don't. So we just keep working. And you have to get creative. You do because we've done huge festivals where there's so many people on site that it obliterates the cell phone signal, you know? And because we are completely mobile, we do not bring in trucks with satellite connections. That's not what we're doing because everything has to be on this camera. So what do you do? You get creative and you find unique ways to get out when nobody can. And that's what the fun of it is. That's, you know, when you're having 250,000 people on site and you can still broadcast that light show, that you can still broadcast the, the fireworks display and everybody else is going, I can't, I can't get out, but you can, what's going on? And that's the fun of it. It's, it's about sharing that part with somebody else that couldn't really be there. Well, and the fun geeky part for me is we've actually built the technology that enables us to do what we do and we've deliberately kept it mobile and small. We deliberately don't want a studio. I don't have a giant studio, I don't want one because my studio is the middle of that crowd for that concert or the middle of the street for broadcasting a festival or a race or something like that. We can go down to Key West and broadcast Fantasy Fest from the middle of the street in the action and most people can't do that. And the other thing is our quality, we do full quality, full broadcast quality production rather than jerky video from your phone. There's a big difference between what professional broadcast people do and the stuff that somebody's gonna get doing Facebook Live on their phone. Well, as a result of your listening, you've been able to grow exponentially over the last couple of years. Vanessa and Mark, thank you so much for talking with us today. Thank you. And with that, we wrap up another episode of Hampton Roads Business Weekly. Make sure you like us on Facebook and Twitter, then head over to hrbusinessweekly.com to get more information and watch previous shows. For Hampton Roads Business Weekly, I'm Cheryl Tan. We'll see you next week.